And joining us here in the studio today is our lead writer, Mr. Craig Houston. Good morning, John. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm very excited, you know. All right. And you know what happens when I get excited? <laughs> what happens? <laughs> uh, good things happen in zombies. <laughs> At least that's the plan. Well, it, it seems like there is it's quite a bit going on with this, this operation. Oh, boy. Oh boy. Uh, all things zombies, but within, within the zombies experience itself, uh, there is it's quite a bit of story to catch us up on. Yes. So, the uh, I think it's probably fair to give some spoilers at this point. Um, I'll try and keep it light. <laughs> at the end of at the end of Blood of the Dead, we saw the premise crew finally breaking out of the cycle. But more than that, we saw that Nikolai Belinsky has now assumed the mantle of leadership. Richtofen gave him the Cronorium, and so from this point on, it's Richtofen. Sorry, it's Nikolai, not Richtofen is calling the shots. Whereas over on Classified, we finally learned that the Ultimus versions of the characters didn't actually die on the moon. But more than that, at the very end of the map, they met the Primus version. So we had Primus and Ultimus face to face. Where are we going to go from there? Well, guess what Idiot Craig decided? <laughs> let's put them all in one map and double the narrative workload. So that's what we did. Well, let's let's talk to Idiot Craig about, about yes. this. Yes. So whenever you talk about sort of the narrative workload, put it in perspective. Whenever you, when you take on an experience like Blood of the Dead, like uh -huh. Classified, you're generally talking about how many lines of script? From two and a half thousand is, is, is probably an average. We've gone up above that sometimes on maps like Revelations. And that's split between our principal characters and any kind of audio logs or guest appearances that we might have. Um, for Alpha Omega, it's actually about five and a half thousand yeah. lines. So when you've got Primus and Ultimus running around together in the same map, any combination of different foursomes, you know, it's it's fun to see how they react to each other and how they reconcile their various differences. So, you know, beyond just all their dialogue, this is also one of the biggest maps we've ever done in terms of narrative Easter eggs. Let me just say there's a lot of ancillary characters that you have met in the past, or if you've not met them, you've at least heard about them, and mm -hmm. they are going to pop up in various ways throughout the map. Well, whenever we talk about the map, which we're going to get into shortly, I mean, we're talking about an experience that, so from a narrative perspective, what, 500 lines? Huge. And the map itself is is several hundred percent larger than... Well, well, I mean, that's that's the big thing. I mean, um, have we... Had, we well, we'll get to do it. I, do we start taking a look? Should we take a look? Well, uh, so, you know what? Probably. Let's just, let's jump into it. Well, I think the first thing is that, you know, there's been a lot of rumors for a while that we were going to be going to Nuketown, but as always, things are never as simple as they appear. I mean, they are not. the sign that you'll see when you arrive identifies it as Camp Edward, which, you know, isn't quite what people thought Nuketown was necessarily, because what it turns out to be is that it is a front for something else, something much, much larger. larger. This is actually a facility owned and operated by a group known as Broken Arrow. And once you start scratching the surface, you're going to realize that, you know, the nuke town that you think you know really is, I was going to say literally the tip of the iceberg, but that's not true. It's figuratively the tip of the iceberg. I think the overall map is many times larger than the original. I can't remember the exact proportion, so I'll just say if it, if it was like that, it's more like that. We've got a very complicated relationship with icebergs this, this year. Well, we don't make stories. <laughs> that, that's, that's the chaos story, so just just keep that to just the side. General, just keep, the, keep that fair, to the side. Fair, fair, fair. Uh, okay, so it, talk to us a little bit about the implications of having the Primus and Ultimus crews working together for the first time. Um, how does that how does that begin shaping our experience here? It's well, it, I think everyone knows that you know the, the, the main difference. The Primus crew got to go on a very kind of emotional journey, searching for their souls and trying to save them and everything. Whereas Ultimus were a bit more goofy stumbling around having a bit of a laugh and not too caring too much about the fate of the universe now under Nikolai's leadership you know obviously he's going to first of all find out that things weren't quite as simple mm -hmm. as he thought and you know Richterman always had reasons for keeping secrets to himself Nikolai is going to struggle a little bit with that because once you've read that chronorium and you know what's coming should you tell people or do you try and just nudge them along or did the book say that you never told them it's a real can of worms but like i say getting 
the different versions of the characters in the same map, you really, really see the, the contrast, you know. Richtofen, Ultimus Richtofen, insane. Utterly insane. I mean, Primus is only marginally more stable, but he's, he's got kind of a, a mellower soul. Drunk Nikolai bumbling around looking for his vodka and going on about his ex-wives. As I say, it's kind, of a, <laughs> it's kind of a reminder of how far the characters have come and seeing what they do and don't recognize in each other is, is part of the fun. Well, and you get to play as both. Yes. Uh, well, tell us, was was that a, a bit of a, a reunion of sorts? It was it a walk down memory lane from a narrative standpoint in terms of like how those personalities? In, in a weird way, it's it's funny. I remember saying this when, when we did Classified. Because we'd spent so long with Primus since Origins forward, really, and we tried to make them more realistic and give them a lot more emotional resonance, which I definitely think we achieved. You know, if you look at the Black Ops 3 season and all those death scenes uh it was it was <laughs> it was nice to see people crying as much as i actually cried when i wrote some of them because i, I it wasn't I, funny it wasn't funny I'm sorry. it wasn't but no it's, <laughs> it's no laughing matter um you know and and that emotional journey that we'd taken them on that was that was hugely important to me so when we first decided to go back to ultimus a little part of me was a bit didn't weren't as much fun they didn't have as much day but once i started writing the jokes again and making myself laugh a lot yeah. And hopefully other people, it's no good if it's just me that laughs. But, you know, so initially there was a bit of a resistance for me to bring back Ultimus because I thought we'd progress the characters. Yeah. But doing Classified and then doing this where we get them to together, it's, you know, it's the best of both worlds. It really is. All right. So here we are. We find ourselves back in Newtown. Yep. Take us on a stroll, Greg. Take us on a stroll. Well, look, there's a bus. Uh, it's not the bus. It's not going anywhere. Uh, that's not to say that Ted isn't necessarily going to appear somewhere down the line, but, you know, he's a robot. He's kind of difficult to get rid of. So like I was saying earlier, a lot of these areas are going to be familiar to people. Obviously, with a, a slight twist, there's going to be lots of, like every time we, we do a map, you know, it gets, it gets its own sheen on it. But this, like I said earlier, literally just represents a small fraction of actually what's there to be discovered. So, you know, we let people start off thinking they know what they're getting into, and then as they get deeper into the game, we obviously pull the rug out from under them and suddenly they're in a state of panic, not knowing what's coming next. That's the way we do things. Talk to me a little bit about sort of the, the lighting and the environment. I, it, to me, I mean, they, it, it's a beautiful looking map. It, it is, and in fact, that's one of the things that the characters uh, will, will talk quite a lot about um, is, in fact, I think, I think it's, um, Ultimus Nikolai, it says, who are billionaires who live in such luxury? <laughs> um, so they all they all have their impressions of what's going on in the map. But as you see now, we're starting to go into some of the lower levels, into the, the Broken Arrow facility where, yeah, like all our good scientific research groups, they've been doing all sorts of things that they maybe shouldn't have been doing or definitely had consequences that they may not have expected. As we find ourselves down here in the bunker, uh -huh. uh, talk, talk to us a little bit about the kind of the, the size of the experience because I'm seeing things in Nuketown that, that I haven't seen before. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's of a magnitude of four, I think is the right way to say it. Okay. Four times bigger. What you used to see was a quarter of what's really there now. I'm just approaching statistics in different ways here and none of them are very well, but yeah, it's at least four times the size of what Nuketown originally was. Uh, what, were, what were some of your favorite elements to, to build back into this experience? Well, I mean, the, the biggest one for me really was narrative to kind of get into the, the, the narrative history of the building. I mean, people, I remember people asking me years and years ago, why was Marlton in the bunker? Hmm. So, you know, that that's something that we're going to get to revisit a little bit, shall we say. So I, I think, you know, even beyond what people actually knew of Nuketown, there was just a lot of very significant narrative threads that we knew that we had to come back to. I mean, we, we explored a little bit of Broken Arrow in the comic book series we did uh, a couple of years ago with the, the Victus crew. Um, we saw some of Russman's history to that. Uh, but this is this is much more of a deep dive, and you will get to see some of the things they are responsible for, including some twists on traditional enemies and traditional weapons. I think you saw some lightning hounds running around there who are a little bit of a, a variation on the usual. Yeah, uh, hellhounds. A note for 
for viewers. This yes. is a uh, sort of pre-release build. There's some temp audio in there, so yeah, it might be some of mine. So if you hear a, <laughs> if you hear a Scottish person or a robot yelling out, that's just because this build is before we had implemented in the actual actors' dialogue. And yeah. that's that's another thing. God, they had fun doing both characters. But that'll that'll sound a little different tomorrow when it's out. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, so let. Uh, Prior to just over the last couple of days, we've seen the the Ray Gun Mark II. Oh yeah, the Ray Gun Mark II on, uh, on our social channels. Talk to us about the Ray Gun Mark II. Well, Ray Guns have got a long history in zombies, and um, you know people always like to see the Ray Gun coming back. And this time, the Ray Gun Mark II is coming back with a very special twist. I don't want to explain exactly how it functions, but. Let's just say you can modify it or put it together in a number of different ways that significantly alter its functionality. So it kind of becomes a customize your own ray gun the way you exactly. like kind of ray gun. Good old ray. <laughs> <laughs> so the inventiveness of oh. the, with the, uh, the ray gun doesn't end there. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's a new perk that's being introduced. Yes, 